There we go. I'm back. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. OK, great. OK, let's see. And can you see this window? Cool. What are you guys seeing now? Are you seeing, you seeing the slides, right? Or at least the window? Yeah, there's a, a slide with some animation on. OK, you're not seeing this other white window that I've got that I can see with my notes on it, right? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no. We can see the browser. We can cool. see a browser, a top of a browser, but that's it. Yeah, that's good enough. Cool. All right. Yeah, well, yeah, thanks, Rob. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks for um, inviting me to do this. Uh, it's always super cool to come back and see new faces and um, get involved in Greenside again. You know, as you know, I've got a huge amount of value, and that's really where I got my start in in design so i'm always really grateful and happy to to, to come back and, and chat to you guys um so this is a little bit i guess kind of informal i'm not like a, a lecturer or anything uh, at this point <laughs> uh, i've been a designer now since uh since i left greenside i think i graduated in like 2014 ish um so coming up on eight almost nine years since i was at greenside um so a little bit about myself um, so I was born in Johannesburg in South Africa, lived there, worked there until 2019, and uh, then I moved to the US. Uh, so I live in Seattle, which is a city, and Washington, which is a state, um, with my wife, two dogs, and a cat. And uh, if anyone knows me well, they know I'm into kind of good design, coffee, watches, and kendo, which is a Japanese martial art. Um, I'm currently a senior UX designer at Google. So I'll show you just like a little bit about where I stay so you kind of like get a feeling for um, where I am. So I live on Mercer Island, which is a island in the middle of a huge lake in Washington near Seattle. So you can see Seattle's there on the left, uh, Space Needle, that's kind of one of the big things, uh, one of the big landmarks in Seattle. And I'm kind of in the middle between these two cities, Seattle and Bellevue. Um, and Seattle's famous for a lot of things, but like, Two things that I really love about it are the fact that it's near Snoqualmie Falls. I don't know if you've, if anyone's watched Twin Peaks, but uh, there's like a really famous shot of these falls that David Lynch used in the opening sequence. Um, so yeah, that's just like a nerdy kind of uh, piece of <laughs> film uh, stuff there. Um, and it's also near Mount Rainier, which is this massive mountain in the US. Um, it's a, about like two hours drive south, but you can see it from everywhere in Seattle. And it's actually an active volcano, so that's kind of interesting to think about. Um, and as Rob mentioned, uh, I started off in uh, Super Ultra or what was called Super, or what it was called Terrestrial is now called Super Ultra. And um, there kind of got my start in um, uh, design thinking, facilitation and training. It was, it was a firm that did a lot of stuff. I also did physical product design and testing for products. Um, as well as uh, things like design for HR strategy at Standard Bank. And we worked with a lot of uh, kind of local clients, uh, made some furniture for Superbalist. We did some train interiors for Transnet and some innovation stuff for PwC. Really just like a mix of um, kind of like design thinking stuff, innovation, product design. And, you know, since I was the only digital designer, I was doing a mixture of um, kind of UX and UI work uh, as well as the physical product design stuff. And this is really because when I was at, at Greenside, you know, I was exposed to uh, what design can be on kind of like a broader scale. And um, I wanted to go somewhere where I could experience multiple kinds of design at the time. Terrestrial seemed like a good place to be, um, to do that. Um, from there, I moved on to Deloitte Digital in Johannesburg as a, as a consultant. Um, a designer essentially, but just, you know, working in the consulting space and work for just basically every, every sort of big business that exists um, in South Africa at the time. So, you know, Standard Bank, OpenServe, ABSA, and again, it was a mixture of design thinking, facilitation and workshops, um, a little bit more digital product design, actually like creating uh, UI and UX that would be shipped for, for these large companies uh, and thinking about like uh, UX on an enterprise scale 
um, and what that means for for a large business. Uh, we also kind of dipped our toe into like what does human centered design look like as an operating model for a business where you integrate that human centered aspect into um, into parts of your company beyond just like the design division, for example. And that point, I was kind of a, a UX manager. And so through that connection, um, I was able to kind of move pretty somewhat seamlessly between um, Deloitte Johannesburg and Deloitte in, in Seattle. Um, I picked Seattle because I, you know, having lived in Joburg my whole life, I kind of wanted to be around some interesting nature instead of just, you know, the old Joburg mine <laughs> scene. So, um, you know, Seattle has mountains and water and everything. So yeah, Seattle was the, the place to be. Um, and here I worked on some really interesting clients. You know, there's big retail clan, clients out here in the Pacific Northwest. So um, my, my main ones were Walmart, Costco, uh, and Nike, essentially. And so I spent about almost a year at Nike. Um, I can't really say exactly what I was doing, but uh, I was working on their, on their kind of production line in a way, like the digital production line and figuring out how to help designers design better throughout that process. Um, <clears throat> but at Deloitte, I really got exposure to kind of full agile digital product design and shipping products. And we actually ended up, I helped design the, um, the mobile app for Thrivent, which is like a financial services organization here. And I did a lot of UX project management uh, as, a, as a UX creative director in Deloitte Digital Seattle. And that brings us to today where uh, I now work for Google as a senior UX designer. Um, and uh, the, main, the two main products that I work on within Google in the ads organization uh, are Google Analytics and Optimize. And at Google, a lot of my work is kind of cross product strategy, product visioning, some interaction design, like doing actual product design. but. A lot of it is is essentially design strategy and trying to figure out how to um, work within the Google ecosystem to get stuff shipped for for users. And the impact is just completely different. You know, analytics as a product is um, has a user base of tens of millions. Uh, and so when you're making a change to something like that, it's just completely a uh, different kind of scenario if you're shipping something out to a couple thousand people. So there's a lot of like strategy that has to take place and validation of things. And, and that's kind of what I, what I do. So, you know, throughout this process and throughout my career, I'm always kind of thinking, uh, well, you know, what are we going to design next? Um, like how is design or how is the, the world of design kind of affecting um, how we create and what we do? And, you know, it's also selfishly for me, a way to figure out like, where do I want to go next with my career? Um, you know, what do I, where do I want to take my design practice? So I spend my time kind of thinking a, a lot about these, these questions. Um, and I would say that today, current day design has, has sort of reached a peak where we're great at on-screen uh, interaction. And maybe like the zenith of this was around uh, Material 2, Google uh, Material Design 2, where uh, essentially screen interactions were based on print and they were driven by the idea of physical layers of paper moving over each other and um, how you could represent that on uh, on a screen um, and you know most modern interfaces still adhere to this with the internet being basically like a, a interactive 2d experience emulating print in some way or emulating editorial design um, but i think material three <clears throat> which you can see here, um, I just lost my window, give me a second, there we go, uh, is uh, a great example of how, you know, we're at a turning point in design where form is fluid and, and kind of based on the need for scalable interfaces that break the boundary of a fixed ratio instead of being so locked into kind of one screen, one form factor. Um, oop, there we go, just a couple of examples of Material 3 and kind of how it, adapts and changes based on various interface forms. And you can see it's no longer kind of locked into that same uh, mindset around 2D print. It's more like how do we scale things and how do devices and interfaces change based on different interaction modes. And so really, I think, you know, this is this kind of turning point we're at 
and uh, we have to start thinking about kind of what what comes next. And this change is driven by improvements on multiple fronts. So better artificial intelligence and machine learning is improving how we make complicated calculations uh, at scale. Um, processing power has increased exponentially on devices to the point where software can run, like really powerful software can, can run almost anywhere. Um, the internet and, con and connectivity is widespread and people are capable of downloading huge amounts of data uh, in real time. And uh, both the uh, 3D graphics and tools to make 3D graphics have advanced to the point where you know, the tools are more accessible, the graphics are more realistic, um, sensors are cheaper and embedded in multiple devices uh, in your home and beyond in, in the world. You know, blockchain technology offers this mechanism for traceable information, uh, enables secure interactions and kind of uh, potentially enables like completely new economic models and hardware is evolving to the point where, you know, augmented and virtual reality are kind of really at the cusp of, um, of consumer adoption. Um, so, all of this leads us to be able to kind of project out uh, and think um, on a time horizon, at least between kind of now and, and five years. So given all these factors, I've been thinking about a view from the current day, you know, things we can do right now to advance our practice, um, as well as things that are further out that might uh, enable us to design differently in the next sort of five-ish years. Um, and all of these ideas might be worth thinking about as a student today and exploring how they might influence your design practice now and what you might want to do in the future. You know, what kind of jobs will designers have? Um, how will our roles adapt to meet the, the need, like the new user needs and challenges and opportunities that we'll have? Um, I do want to preface that this is just my opinion. It's something that I've been kind of mulling over for a while. <clears throat> and it's, uh, you know, in terms of uh, what, I what I'd like to do next, uh, it doesn't represent like, the opinion, opinions of Google, um, although I have used like a mix of public Google examples in here. And unfortunately I can't share the, the private ones, but that's just kind of how it goes. <laughs> mm. So yeah, here are um, <clears throat> seven trends that I think are shaping the UX of tomorrow. And these kind of just scratch the surface, um, but worth digging into. So the first one is the idea of natural and gestural interfaces. Uh, devices like the Nest Home Hub already have sensors, sensors that monitor when a user is looking at the screen. You know, how will these devices and interfaces respond to factors like proximity and facial expression and natural gestures? You know, I think we've, um, we've had voice interfaces for a while now, and some of the awkwardness around um, those interactions stem from the fact that you know, humans are expressible beyond just the audible. Like right now I'm using my hands to talk and kind of making expressions with my face. Um, and in the future, I think interfaces will be designed to adapt based on the kind of attention they're receiving from a user and uh, display information that is relevant based on that, that context. Um, for example, you know, displaying information that's based on how close, how far a user is or responding to hand gestures or even responding to multiple um, users at once that are talking and kind of using the same device. So I think the idea of uh, devices interacting more naturally and kind of um, being able to feel out the human intera interaction is going to be incredibly important. So in the future, uh, a spatial UX designer or a physical UX designer would need to consider physical space and how things interact with uh, these adaptive digital interfaces through natural language, gestures, and proximity. And as I go through these trends, you see I'll, I'll kind of laid it up in terms of like, what is the trend? What are the things that, are, that, that kind of make it up? And then how does it um, affect our uh, a role as designers? Or what are these kind of future roles that we might have? So the next one is the idea of um, AI-driven design optimization. Uh, and I think we've all seen examples of AI art or seeing the news story of, you know, this artwork here that um, won, an, won a human art competition, even though it is designed or like created by an AI. Uh, but I think like the really interesting thing about AI and design is how it affects our design process. So both artificial intelligence and machine learning 
are technologies that can greatly accelerate our workflow. They can make computations beyond uh, what the human mind can handle in terms of scale. You know, in product design, uh, interiors, manufacturing, this means AI can drive generative structures that can be tuned in terms of strength and uh, materials and um, essentially creating products that would be, you know, almost impossible for, for humans to make just in the, in the sense that it can be like generative and uh, driven by like an AI process where it becomes almost like this organic frame, like you can see on that, that motorcycle. Um, in graphic design, it means that photo assets, content generation uh, can be, you know, really easily produced, like reducing time and budget because you don't have to go through the, the process of um, doing a photo shoot or, or kind of illustrating something. You can, you can prompt an AI to make uh, an image for you really quickly. For example, on this, this cosmopolitan color, this was made in like something like 20 seconds. Um, but the one that really interests me as a UX designer is how we can use things like AI and A-B testing, for example, together to make adaptive design interfaces that automatically evolve based on a set of views and needs. So if you take something like e-commerce, for example, imagine if your Squarespace site redesigned itself uh, in order to increase your sales or your article views or just based on a current style that you prompted. Um, it's very possible using uh, technologies like multi-arm bandit, which is a, an A-B testing method where users are kind of push down a progressive funnel towards conversion, you could actually tie that to artificial intelligence and create designs that morph um, and align to that goal uh, and basically design themselves to be the best possible site that they can be, you know, obviously starting from like a set of existing prompts that a designer would create. So designers need to be AI whisperers um, in the future and even today uh, to work alongside machine learning models and AI models <clears throat> to fine tune them, to provide the initial prompts and assets, but then also to monitor the outcomes to ensure that they meet the goals of the end user or the designer themselves. You know, I think it's really a case of using this technology to enhance what we do as designers and um, accelerate our process. It's not like AI is gonna take our jobs. You know, you hear a lot of this like, oh yeah, is it gonna take our jobs? I don't think so. I think there's the human element is still super necessary but how we use these technologies to um, to augment our process is really interesting. Uh, the next one is uh, distributed and communal interfaces. Um, so, you know, we're reaching a really interesting point where um, screens are everywhere now uh, and really context is what matters most. And I've got a quick video here. I'll see if I can get it to play. It's not so important what she's saying, but this is, you know, something that was announced at Google I.O. Um, it's essentially like a, a Nest Home tablet that can be removed from a dock so that everyone in the house can use it as a communal tablet. And then the dock is actually a Bluetooth or like a speaker. So, you know, it can function as a speaker separately and function as a, um, a voice interface separately, but the tablet can kind of be you know, added to it or removed from it, depending on what it is that you want to do, which I think is a really interesting idea. It's kind of like democratizing the interface and moving it um, beyond the boundaries of like public or, or private. And and we've kind of seen this, you know, proliferate throughout society. We have screens and McDonald's to order things. We have like screens at the point of sale to check out. And if you think about like the number of devices that you have, from watches to phones to you know voice enabled assistance um, interactions kind of move from device to, to device and rather are sustained by user identity instead of actually like physically owning the, the object <clears throat> so yeah i think it's a really great example um, of how people kind of actually use technology in the home or in in the world uh, in a shared way and it kind of solves the problem of like you know, what do you do with all these tablets that you have <laughs> lying around that essentially become, uh, you know, paperweights or, or whatever? Um, it's, you know, still providing useful information, um, but the interface is really shared like across this, this, this kind of community. Um, ooh, yeah, here we go. So in the future, we might have something like uh, contextual design or context UX, which is not limited to devices, but rather 
what physical or digital interactions we want to orchestrate. Um, and they might create experiences that move between public and private settings and explore how this context changes the interface um, and the interaction design. The next one is virtual presence and connect and connection, which I'm sure we've all experienced over the past number of years. And I mean, currently we have Zoom and Meet and Teams and FaceTime and uh, many ways to get together where essentially we're a bunch of chat heads or chat bubbles, but um, I think very soon being connected will span a spectrum um, of immersive VR to mixed reality experiences um, and how we interact with each other at a distance is going to take on multiple forms where technology is an enabler, not, not a hindrance. Um, and we're already kind of seeing this, um, <clears throat> already kind of seeing this in games like Fortnite or Minecraft or, or Roblox, things like that, you know, where large scale events were hosted. But um, I think those types of meetings are kind of niche and will scale beyond those use cases to have multiple functions uh, or purposes, you know, from something potentially meaningful and personal like Project Starlight from Google, which I'll show you in a second, to things like Meta's Horizon Worlds and other platforms where people can meet and work and interact in new ways. You know, there's also already things like Spatial, uh, which is the site down at the bottom, where there's repositories of visual, visual uh, virtual worlds that are created by artists and brands where meetups and conferences can take place. Um, and I think the key here is, you know, how do we turn this into something that can be used in a widespread way and enable new ways of doing things just like Zoom did for uh, for us in the pandemic. And I'll show you a quick uh, overview of Google Starlight. I don't know if many of you have seen this, but essentially it's like a, um, a booth where you can sit down and have a virtual meeting with someone, but it captures all of your um, interactions in real time and uses 3D cameras to create this 3D setting. So it feels like you're actually sitting in a booth with someone um, and having a conversation. And I think the interesting thing about it is that it's taken this idea of virtual presence and virtual meetings to this next level where it's so detailed and so um, realistic that it almost feels like the person is right in front of you. Um, and that's also because of advan advances in a number of technologies that I was mentioned before, like capture technology, um, screens that are super, uh, high quality and be able to provide these images and then streaming data and and, uh, um, and using the internet at these high speeds. So yeah, really interesting. So let me go to the next slide. So maybe in the future we have something like a virtual presence UX designer who will specialize in models of virtual interaction to create seamless connections between people uh, you know, who are geographically or socially distanced. Um, and they'll evolve the frameworks and design experiences that bring people together in ways that, that we're still discovering and figuring out. Uh, the next one is augmented and mixed reality interfaces. Um, so AR enhances the physical world with digital information and creates these new ways of interacting uh, with each other and integrating our online personas into physical space. A great example of this uh, and a really kind of pointed use case is something that was shown at Google I.O. Where, uh, where they showed how you could use something like live translation to make a meaningful difference in people's lives. <clears throat> Language is one of the last great barriers to a shared experience and finding ways for people to understand each other could have massive, massive potential, you know, for social interaction for for commerce and work. But I think uh, the interesting thing for me here is how we can leverage the time we spent crafting like amazing digital experiences on 2D screens and bring those into a new setting completely in context, you know, using computer vision, sound and capturing capabilities. Um, we could make navigating the world for, you know, sensitive populations and really anyone a lot easier. And it could also just be super fun. Um, you know, uh, a good example is like these Ray-Ban, um, these are Ray-Ban glasses. I tried these out pretty recently. I have a friend who works at Meta uh, and she's working on these Ray-Bans and you know, they have two kind of cameras in the, in the frames and they sort of, they speak to you through speakers in the, in the side. 
And I thought they were kind of gimmicky and, you know, lame on the surface. But, uh, you know, if you're out like trying to do any kind of physical activity where you don't want to like GoPro strapped to your head, but you still want to capture the moment, they actually ended up being really useful. You can take videos and capture photos without kind of, you know, interrupting the activity that you're doing at the time. So I thought that was really interesting. And then this Google example, I think is just great. Um, it, sh it kind of shows like what you could do uh, with live translation. If you're able to see text that's kind of moving across a street, a screen and translating in real time, which I think is completely possible. If you look at things <clears throat> like YouTube, where you're already getting live captioning, live translations that are, that are, that are possible. So definitely check this out um, if you haven't heard of it. Uh, there's some information about it on some of the, the online Google systems. So in the future, uh, or, or at least right now, it's worth thinking about how we can overlay digital information onto the physical world in order to enhance these in-person interactions with additional information. Um, you know, I think. Google's in a unique position to do this. It's like a major player in the information space. And the mission is, you know, Google's mission is literally to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. That's like the, the tagline. <laughs> so I'm excited in terms of what we can think about in the space and how we as designers can expand beyond these, you know, opaque screen interactions um, and actually just get out into the world a bit more and apply our design uh, to the real world. <laughs> Second last, we have um, the idea of metaverse spatial UX. Uh, and I know a lot has been said about the metaverse and meta and if it's going to be a really, like if it's going to be a thing or, you know, what, what's going to happen with it. But honestly, I can't imagine it not being a thing. Um, you know, if the internet has any kind of analog today, it's basically a flat 2D world that's still trying to emulate like great print and editorial design. Um, but I think now we have the advances happening in the gaming world where graphics are good enough and accessible, also just mainstream, mainstream enough to where the next iteration of what the internet is today has to be more three-dimensional and kind of um, more rich in terms of the, the design and experience. And I don't necessarily think it has to happen in VR, but I think um, VR might play a big part in it. Uh, the main thing that's exciting to me is that brands and people will, have, will be able to express themselves in such a rich way and create experiences that are so much more engaging in the same way that games are engaging today. So, you know, I think digital architects and UX designers are going to work hand in hand to create meaningful experiences in the metaverse. And I think Greenside actually has a really amazing opportunity here because you have like the entire recipe sitting right there. You know, you've got interior design and architecture, uh, user experience together, um, you know, all of the different functions that, that kind of can be brought together to, to orchestrate uh, great design in the metaverse. Um, and I think, you know, brands will be able to, to express their DNA in completely new ways and enables, you know, much more complex or interesting interactions with customers. For example, we have three retail brands here, Nike, Gucci, and uh, Louis Vuitton. Um, and they all have some sort of like <clears throat> day one version of a metaverse. Nike has Nike land. Gucci has this, I don't know, Gucci land or something. And Louis Vuitton created this entire game called Louis, where you can run around and experience Louis Vuitton in this like digital setting. Um, but I think it's really amazing to think like, what does a Nike store look like if you have no limits in terms of physical location? And, you know, you can literally browse through an entire virtual catalog experience things uh, in three dimensions and, you know, really interact with the brand on a much more emotional level than looking at like a flat surface. So right now and in the future, I think designers will be metaverse UX architects working with the, the world builders to create usable, uh, useful interactions in digital space, both in virtual reality and mixed reality. <clears throat> And our job is going to be to make the metaverse usable, accessible, uh, and meaningful for the next iteration of, of information that we create. And finally, we have the idea of um, the digital twin and how NFTs will, will sustain this new economy. So this is kind of linked to the metaverse idea, and it's something that's um, 
very exciting. <clears throat> where a digital twin is basically a fully accurate digital representation of a physical object. Um, uh, imagine, you know, a Nike shoe that is fully replicated in terms of materials, physics, colors, um, everything that makes it up uh, in, in, uh, but in a digital setting. Um, and this means that we can prototype quicker, we can get feedback faster and potentially own these products in both the physical and digital realm. Uh, and this is all possible with blockchain technology and NFT te technology, which has the potential to solve some of the real major problems around digital um, digital authorship. So, you know, as designers, we can create and use these assets in so many ways, both in places like the metaverse or just even in more straightforward ways, like experiencing a product before you buy it, uh, or even using the technology to kind of reverse engineer a physical product to create completely new iterations of an existing thing. Um, and what's really exciting to me about this is that, um, you know, being able to have a completely accurate digital representation uh, really opens up the avenues in terms of how you experience that product before you experience it in, in the physical reality, uh, or, you know, being able to own the, the same object in both locations gives you a completely new sense of how you experience it. And the longevity of a product, a product could be um, extended beyond its physical life into this kind of digital realm. So in the future, I think the lines between um, physical and digital product design will blur. It might actually become the same thing. And for, you know, designing with this digital twin in mind uh, will allow us to break down the boundaries of this product life cycle and something will have these multiple lives, both in the physical and the digital world. Uh, I'm also very excited about the opportunities this creates for us as digital designers um, and it means our thinking kind of in some way uh, permeates the, the more traditional product design thinking space. Um, and, you know, if uh, some of the stuff that I saw at Nike in terms of um, digital materials and things like that eventually makes it into the real world, I think this is a super exciting space to be in and definitely something to, to kind of mull over in your design practice. So just to sum up, um, Here's a quick recap of you know what we chatted through and this is not an exhaustive list and i could go into more detail on each one but i hope this just gives you a bit of food for thought in terms of you know where you take your own design practice and what do you want to do next um, and how this kind of might impact uh, what we do uh, in design now and like in in the next five years and what's really exciting to me chatting to you as a bunch of students is thinking about what you'll create and what the future of UX uh, holds for all of us. I'm very excited to see um, what the future holds in terms of design, and, uh, and I hope you are too. So yeah, that's my talk. Thank you so much. Um, really appreciate it. And uh, I think we've got time for some questions. Wow, Matt, that was amazing. Very, very cool, man. Thank you so much. Yeah, sorry, I had to blast through it a little bit, but um, <laughs> yeah. Holy crap, like insane food for thought, man. Like you've got me, my <laughs> brain going at like a thousand miles an hour. An hour, very, yeah. very cool. Um, holy crap. Are, are there any questions? Does anybody have um, anything to ask Matt? Comments even? Yes. or Uh, maybe from my side, um, Matt, it's you, Lundy. <laughs> so I was just wondering for interest sake, I mean, as designers, everyone's always speaking about the the work culture at Google and um, what is the culture like? Can you take your dog to work, for for example? Or <laughs> like, how does it work? How is it working for Google? Yeah, no, I think the the culture is, is really great. I mean, it, it's... It's one of those strange things where you're always seeing it from the outside and you're reading articles about it and um, and uh, and it really is like that in real life. <laughs> you can take your dog to work. And I think the the nice thing about it is that, you know, Google's hiring process is so complicated and um, and you know difficult to get through that everyone who kind of gets through that process um, essentially is there to contribute to the the mission and the culture and the values and uh, so you're just you're not there's, there's kind of no um, I don't know how to put this but like there's kind of no irritating people 
you know, everyone's super smart and really productive and it can be a bit intimidating, but I think Google also creates the, the space for you to, um, to make your experience there what you want of it. Um, and it's definitely, you know, out of the companies that I've consulted to and the work that I've done, you know, in, in the States, it's certainly the most, um, uh, I, I would say like the, the nicest, you know, work culture that I've experienced so far. So yeah, I would say it's pretty good. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Yeah. I'm just speaking. Hi, I'm Matthew. Hey. <laughs> it's involved in a really fascinating field, knowledge, whatever it's <laughs> actually a bit beyond my intelligence, still of the old school. <laughs> um, but most of what I've read or come across with UX design is that the key word seems to be a meaningful experience. And who determines what a meaningful experience is and how is it determined? Yeah, so uh, you're sorry, you're breaking up a little bit, but I think the question was, you know, what is a meaningful experience and, and how is it determined? Yeah, that was Ingrid, so she's just giving you a hard time. You know, and <laughs> my partner. We found Yes, no, sure. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think it's a great question. Um, and I think it has a lot of answers, especially in terms of uh, the goal of UX, which I think is always to meet the user need. So, you know, we use these terms like, oh, it's a meaningful experience and, you know, it's something that, that uh, provides value. But I think really what that means is, you know, within the context that you're trying to create and you're trying to solve a problem, are you providing value to the user at that point? So, you know, if I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying to like buy something using a payment method or I'm trying to uh, apply for a loan or, you know, I'm trying to get married at a, um, at a court, all of those interactions have the potential to be like really frustrating or really smooth and, uh, um, and seamless. And I think when UX, when UX works well, uh, you know, you'll notice or not notice, you know, the interaction might become completely, um, you may not even kind of realize that you're sort of going through the process. And I think that's the goal is either it's so good that you notice it or it's so good that you don't even notice that it's there. Um, and that for me is really like what creating a mean, meaningful experience is about. Uh, do you solve a user need in a, in a unique way? So you're, it's still design, you're still trying to, um, <clears throat> to provide some sort of useful service or use, you know, some sort of use to the thing that you're creating. Um, but whoever is going through that experience should come out the other end of it feeling like um, they just did something good or, you know, experienced a moment of delight or, you know, had no friction at all. I think we, we can all, we can all recognize when something hasn't gone right. Uh, you know, if you interact with almost any government agency anywhere, you know, that's certainly not a, a meaningful or a, uh, uh, an awesome experience. So yeah, that would be my, my kind of take on it. In a way, it's kind of like Dieter Rams is good design is invisible, right? Like you, you don't really know you're, you, well, you, you know, like you said, when you, you know you're having a bad experience because you're having a bad experience, but when you're having a good experience, it's just kind of, it's supposed to be good. <laughs> exactly, yeah, 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 for sure. Cool, man. Um, oh, wait. I think I think we've got one question here in the chat. Uh, very interesting what you shared regard as a prospective student. Where would one begin regarding multimedia design or inter interactive design? Um, you know, I think becoming a student is a great is a great first step. Uh, you know, there's a lot of awesome research resources that are out there on on the internet and you know you can kind of like use those resources to the best of your ability but you know in order to get a good grounding in design i think um learning 
the basics and the principles kind of from the ground up is, is very beneficial. So, you know, I'd say you're on the right track if you're thinking about um, furthering your education, furthering your education, kind of getting into that world. Uh, it helped me immensely. And I think for most people, it's a, it's a great starting point. I think the barrier to kind of becoming a designer um, from scratch without formal training is just so much higher. And, you know, we have these amazing resources available to us most of the time. So yeah, that would, that would be my advice. Use my advice, use the mentors and the resources that you have um, to make that first step. Awesome. Thank you, Matt. Um, are there any other questions in the chat? Was, was that the, have a quick look. All right. Awesome. Great, Matt. I don't want to, I know that you're probably going to be heading off to work like any minute soon. So I'm going to, I'm going to wrap up for us, but, um, I just wanted to say like, thank you again. And also like an, an amazing lecture. I think it's really useful to look at the future of, of such an, un, an unpredictable, um, medium or, or space and like, like digital to be able to view it through like certain kind of very clear lenses. And I think you've done such a good job at like <laughs> figuring out what those are. So, th and, and for giving it to us. So thank you. Really, really appreciate it. Yeah, sure. Sounds good. And I'll, uh, I'll be up in South Africa next year. So I'll try pop by in, in March. Brilliant. Please do March. I'm putting it in my diary immediately. Yeah. <laughs> yeah cool. Thank you, man. Yeah. Thanks, Des. Yeah. Thanks for the opportunity. Appreciate it. Sure, thank you. Cool. So thanks humble. for joining us. You're amazing. And well awesome. done, hey. Oh, yeah, thanks. You've really, thanks, you've really taken on the world, so congratulations. Oh, thank you. Brilliant. All right, breakfast time. I'll chat to you all <laughs> soon. <laughs> cool, man. Thanks again, yeah. Matt. Take it easy. Give your dog a big hug for us and the rest of your family, okay. and um, we'll see you next year. Cool. Cheers. Okay, cheers, cheers, man. Bye. 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 Hello. Nee, dat is fijn. Ik heb niks aan. Ik doe niks aan. Dus die assembly lecture het net opgehaald te bel. Ja, so ik het gedink jou timing is excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Where am I still? I should. What do you mean? What do you
Maar waar die groene ding, want ek denk dat toch zelfs en sy sê, wat sê vir bel nie, vir zelf, want jy het ons klaar, ek het vir basis gesê, denk jy het klaar die offers gemaakt. Ek weet nie wat jy vir al gesê nie, maar ek het vir al gesê, Yo. You know. Yo, yo. I'm going to have to finish so anywhere. I can't. En die kaart daar, daar aan gedink op wat hy soos ek met gebouw en die toegeraai moet my besel op te tel, maar in afval weet u die span is so rustig nou, kan ek vir jou sê nie Tante en Ursula en Poosha, hulle werk so mooi saam hulle help mekaar hulle is so rustig en ek is bang om daar nervous energy die in te bring, sy is so druk op allemaal, sy, ek weet nie ek het nie kracht of ek het nie kracht nie ek het nie kracht daar nie Ja, en sy het ons so van een gedietje nie, sy het ons rechtig in die kak gedroom. Sy het lete dat sy was siek, sy moes twee weke kennis gees, sy was die halte van die tijd was sy siek, ook in die gent leef, ek vloe dit nie. En sy het lete dat nie omgegeen, so sy sê nou, sy het nie brood gebrand nie, maar ek voel sy het wel vir my, sy het ons in die kak gedroom. as sy nie tver was en daarom al tyd gewerkt het en ek so al tyd uitgesit het, so dat jy my verschil van my tyd. Nee, nee, ek weet nie, ek het net nie die seel of die hart om vir te sê nie, nie, maar ek wil, ek wil al nie terugheen nie, ek dink ons allemaal werk goed saam, ons is, jy het ons al probeer baie hard, sy sit al kop neer in sy werk en, jy weet, en ek dink, Nou, dan vat ons een bruik, ons drink koffie, ons vertel een grap, iemand werk daar, en dit weet, is nie van daar aanhoudende gepraterei, en gekeier, en ge, kom ons hou een meeting oor dit, en kom ons nou eers lief, so is Shara van doen jou werk. Ek het nie wist al vir nie, want weet nie wat sy het op my verskrift bepaald, ek kan nie nog druk vat vir nie, want sy wil aandag het, sy wil die goed moet gebeur, en daai een moet dit doen, en daai een sy video moet beter, en daai een sy socials moet beter, en daai een kan, dit is onhoorige druk, wat ons nie nou nie meer is. Nee, is net dat dit is een les wat sy moet leer, denk ek, want sy het geklaar oor alles hier so, en sy werk so hard, en sy wet, en sy daad, maar dat sy nou gewillig is om daar moesjes en daar is te droog om terug te kom, is een les, denk ek, want sy het ons nie, ek denk, sy was nie dankbaar vir wat sy vond. Dit is, want ek weet, sy was kort, my nie weet later in sy resaan, so ek, en ek wil ek is ook die lis vir daar wat ek moet waar nie, dat ek nie van of sê om stil te blij na werk te doen, dat sy gaan afset wees of gaan sal om wat te doen. Ja. Ja, ek denk ook so, sy wil nie, tot ons reden, tot sy nie wou blij nie, so is hy nie van die begin af aan haar wees, 
bedoel van het dat toch kom het moet het om meetings bij meetings bij meetings om naar alles te bespreken wat er niet uitwerkt. Dit en dit was die altijd wat ik al zei dat dit is nou wat het is. So jy moet op haar mouw en op aan beweer. En en dat is om aan te beweer. So sy kan nie deel daar nie. Sy wil sy sy wil goed controleer het daarlik. Oh, ja kan nie. Nee, nee. Nee, ek stem saam met jou saam. Nee, ach, sy nie, ek voel slaag, ek bedoel, dit is nie, ek was nou baie naast die tapie voor, maar dit is nie, ek wil dit nie heen nie. Ek wil nou weer, ek wil nie heen sy nie terugkom. Ek voel soos een beetje maar nie, ja. Want sy is een goeie persoon, en ek dink ons het toch, het weer haar good times opwees, en ek wil ons bouw die luis, en ons moet ons probeer vast, en so aan, maar die pressure wat sy gebring het in die spans, en die dit nie, dit, 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 sy mense gekritiseer op een manier, en allemaal bring maar alle wees, dat dit is nie, die handel, die handel, die handel, die handel, die handel, die handel, ja, as die mama net wat hier vast sê, wat ek het al die draam ook geleer, dat al iemand is, wat jy moet op die boel maak, aan die nou ook, Ah, ok, ja, ja, het maakt sin. Ek kan ook net wel sê, en klaar, ons het so dat klaar die goal. Nee, nee, dit is fijn. Nee, dit is ook fijn. Nee, ek kan nie sê. Kan jy met een lekker opdeel? Dankie. Bye-bye.